Well, this show's starting off strong. Welcome back to more AEW on TW 2020. We are here at the final show of July in 2022. It is a rampage. We start off with a hot tag team match. Good way to start off the show as the Young Bucks defeat Top Flight. Uh, the Young Bucks each score almost 100. Uh, lack of psychology. Yeah, true. After the match, Jake Roberts comes out. And he has the vision beside him. He says, Young Bucks, you're one of the best teams in the world. I can never deny that. But there's something that you can never have over the vision. You see, we have the Murderhawk monster, Lance Archer. He's one of the biggest stars in AEW. Both in terms of name value, in terms of impact, and in terms of size. You can't ever beat size like Lance Archer has. And you can never take on the fire that the future two-time tag team champions can bring at a moment's notice. And as, you know, he's probably going to say it's more when the Young Bucks cut him off and say, shit, sure, sure, whatever. You could talk, you know, people online always talk about, oh wow, these two work really well together. But here's the thing. You guys aren't a real tag team. You, you guys, you don't have anything to bring you together. The Young Bucks, the Briscoes even, we have that brotherly connection. We have that bond since birth. Well, you two, you're just singles guys who floundered alone until you combined forces and now you think that it makes you this hot shit. You know what? You can laud your fluky tag titles all you want, your your tag record, because you got the big guy, the Murderhawk monster, Lance Archer, and you have the third eye visionary, Matt Seidel. You can you can parade that all you want. It means nothing when it comes to the best tag teams of all time, like the Briscoes and especially the Young Bucks. After this, Scott Steiner is seen in his gym. Nat Murphy is working up behind him. Uh, alone, as in, like, it's only Nat Murphy, uh, no Will Hobb, no Willie Mack. As Scott is talking to Bronson, or with Bronson Steiner, the new TNT champion. And this is what happens when you side with Big Papa Pump. When you work at your craft, when you hone your body, you can easily conquer all these tiny flippy indie dudes, all these stupid little acrobats pretending to be wrestlers. That's what Willie Mack missed out on. And now with Bronson at the helm over Dynamite, He's gonna keep going on and on, showing that the strength is the real name of the game in pro wrestling. And if I look at my next target, the next challenger for Bronson Steiner's World TNT Championship, it's Ricochet. And Ricochet, you're just the same as that little dweeb Garza, getting all these highlight reels with all your flippy stuff, but you're just a flippy idiot pretending to be a wrestler. Now it's time to show you how much we can kick your ass with a real strongman, a real pro wrestler. Scott Steiner's going crazy. Uh, yeah. But yes, Bronson Steiner. He's, if you missed last episode, he's our new TNT champion. Lexi Paradise defeats Ham's Katana. I have renamed the Twisted Bliss to Paradise Lost. Uh, Trouble in Paradise makes more sense, but at the same time, that's Kofi Kingston's move. Uh, and people would know that. Lexi celebrates in the ring for a while, and she's being very disrespectful to the opponents, you know. She's you know, waving goodbye to DK, uh, you know, sunglasses on. She's very, very cocky. This is, like, one of the... This is, like, VIPs, they're already a cocky gimmick, but, you know, they're more of a fancy, bougie, uh, you know, holier-than-thou attitude. You know, they wear fancy dresses, they, you know, uh, got all this fancy air about them. Lexi's just an asshole Hollywood person. That's pretty much the gimmick. But, speaking of the VIPs, they come out and they're flanked by their own heavy, Griffin Slade, who I believe I said was 6'7". Still no Sotnam say. And the VIP is talking to say, your very existence brings up a really good thought, and I gotta thank you for that. Right now, we have a lot on our minds. We don't even have our penthouse to live in because of Pac's stupid little cronies. Right now, we need to get our mind off of things. And, well, you have your big muscly bodyguard, who's big and all, but we have one of the hottest 
prospect, the best rising prospect in all of pro wrestling, in Griffin Slade. And Lexi, she gets her own mic, and she's like, I don't care about Griffin Slade. Just a silent bodyguard that's serving as a replacement for Wardlow. But you two, on the other hand, Tanil, Diona, I'm interested in you. You wanted to challenge me on Wednesday. You know what? I accept that challenge. I'm ready for you. Your call. You're the VIPs. You have this money. You can surely pay off Paul Heyman, can't you? You wanted that challenge, right? Well, you got it. After this, Sheeta is then seen alone in a dark room. She has her championship over her shoulder. She's Brit. I know this may be a little bit late of a response, but I was busy performing my own job as a wrestler in the meantime, in the past week and a half. Only got the chance to listen to your little interview yesterday. And I'm willing to prove you wrong in every sense of the word. You question why Joshis have a stranglehold over the women's division here in AEW, and I'll tell you why. It's because we're the best wrestlers in the world. We're the most devoted to our craft of pro wrestling. And that's no more apparent than in the difference between me and you. You have wrestling as this part-time job, this side gig, because you're focusing on another career, Miss DMD, while you're moonlighting as a wrestler. Me, Mayu, Kana, Io, all of us are devoted to our craft of pro wrestling solely. We know that this is the sport that we love. We know that this is what gets us good. We know that this is what it's all about, while you don't care at all about the wrestling. We've proven we're the best. You still need to prove that you're not just the apple of the American's eye. You're not just this little thing bringing up AEW from nothing, only to be left behind. You want to call yourself a big shot? My title's right here, Britt Baker, and you can come and get it. Honestly, a 58 red promo, not bad for Sheeta. Baron Black is squashed by Jacob Fatu. Oh, 56 for Baron Black, that's... wow. Okay. I forgot to make this a storyline. Oh well, that's fine. Following the match, Fergal Devitt slowly gets into the ring. He has his arm in a sling. It says, as some of you may know, when I took out the inner circle on Wednesday, when me and Jacob Fatu took out the inner circle on Wednesday, I ended up separating my shoulder during that match, and it'll keep me out of action for a little bit. But, the Prince of Pro Wrestling doesn't fall so easily. He doesn't give up so easily just like that. Jacob Fatu, my apprentice, the second member of Princedom, is ready to march his way towards the top of A, E, and as he's about to keep going, he's caught off by the Futures music hitting. And Frederick Hurst has a mic. He says, yawn, 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 blah, 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 all this talk about X is gonna get to the top of AEW, Y is gonna prove that they're the best wrestler. <sighs> it's tiring. Oh, but isn't that the future shtick too? I hear all of you in the crowd ask. I hear you ask yourself, Fergal Devitt and Jacob Fa too. Can't forget that you're there as well. Well, there's more to the future that you haven't quite realized yet. See, right now we've been focusing on our rise to the top, but you don't really know what these two brothers are all about right now. But what we do know What's well known to everyone, backstage, in the crowd, at home, anywhere, we all know that the Prince of Pro Wrestling, Fergal Devitt, Prince Devitt, whatever you want to call him, him having a shoulder injury isn't a surprise at all. It's honestly just a matter of time at this point, injury after injury, and you claim to be this stud in pro wrestling. Well, honestly, Fergie, I don't buy it. Jacob Fatu, you look like a big scary man, and sure, you squashed... whatever his name is. Y you, you have some strength, but here's the thing. Strength isn't all that there is in pro wrestling, and the future can show you that. We got- we are masters of the ground, masters of the sky, masters of words. And we can easily 
show you just how much different the future is in AEW compared to this old guard of the prince, of the immortal, of the best bout machine. The beast, whatever. The future is here, Fergie. And we can show you just what that means. Honestly, like, I think... Okay, well, the awful gimmick, I need to still change that. Uh... Probably... Fergal... I don't know what Fergie... What, what good old Fergie's catchphrase would be, but... Uh, the future... Frederick Curse has insane mic ratings, by the way. I, I know I've mentioned this a few times, but good lord, he is ludicrously good on the mic. After this, we cut to a scene backstage, Paul Heyman's office. A knock comes on the door, and a CD is slid underneath. Obviously, like, in a case, in you know, one of those uh, clear cases. Uh, probably one of the plastic ones, not the paper ones. And it's just an unmarked CD. Well, it probably says, like, just... Play me. Something pretty obvious. Paul Heyman, he waddles to the door. Obviously Heyman, not the quickest guy in the world. Opens it up, he's looking out. The camera even goes to show that there's no one out there. We don't know who left the CD. But, Heyman, he sees it, thinks, well, probably should. It's my job to make sure I know what's going on. Slides it in. Into his TV, and the camera goes around, it... It shows what's being shown. It shows the parking lot where the last episode of Dark was recorded. Um, somewhere else in Maryland. We're in Baltimore right now. I think it's somewhere west, probably, because I think Baltimore's right on the coast. Um, it's where the last episode of Dark was recorded. Kotobushi, he's heading towards his own car when, just as with Kenny Omega, a few months ago, I don't remember, I think it was the beginning of February, I want to say. Um... See, he did wrestle at least one match this year. I'm pretty sure it was... It might have been right after Revolution? I don't know. Kenny... It might have been maybe right before Revolution. I don't know. It was around that time. Just as with Kenny Omega, a bunch of ninjas leap out. I know. It's a little bit ridiculous that they're ninjas. Don't worry about it. And they begin, attack Cody, uh, begin attacking Coda. And Coda does put up a valiant fight. He fights them off pretty well. But eventually... Ninjas get the better hand, they take him away into the van. We come out from the TV, and we see Paul Heyman, he's hammering down on his phone, because it looks more official if you have, you know, a wired phone. And he's he's yelling at people, find out who sent this CD, you know, check the cameras, check everything, find out where Coda is, he's one of the top stars on our program, and I just saw him get captured. The same thing happened to Kenny. We haven't seen him since. Now Coda's gone. What the hell? Find out who's behind this. Find out who slipped that CD in. Heyman is freaking out. He has to be here for a match later tonight. <sighs> Shoulder injuries. Pac does defeat Lucas Frenemir with the, uh, the 450. But he does dislocate his shoulder in the process. Thank you, Pac. Darby Allen comes out after the match. He's heavily bandaged, but he is still standing. And Pac, he looks a little bit impressed as Darby, you know, staggers out there. He has a mic in his hand. And there's a few moments. Probably let the crowd uh, cool down a little bit from the match. Cool down from seeing Darby bandaged out, but still charging out. And he just simply says, Nothing's over till you're dead. I think that's the phrase. It's whatever he usually has written on him, or it might be even tattooed on him. I'm not sure which. And Pac, he just kind of laughs a little bit. Before he decides to march out, his shoulder's hurt. It's fine. And he's ready to try to kill Darby when Sting's music hits. And he gets between them. S Stinger and Pac argue for a bit until Pac decks Sting. With only one arm, apparently. And Sting's knocked down. Probably takes a... Not too hard of a bump. Darby, he leaps into action. He's still very hurt. He attacks Pac. He knocks him down. And Darby is standing a little bit tall over the injured Pac. And he helps up the guy who, in real life, he's associated with. Who I 
probably will also associate now since I'm getting him away from the face paintless sting. Darby helps him up. After this, just a quick segment reminding everyone that Adam Cole and Takahashi are still a thing. They exist. They're alive. Uh, Takahashi is still imprisoned by Adam Cole. Just, just reminding you that this is here. After this, we just get a good match. Uh, Antonio Latenz defeats Zack Sabre Jr. Uh, Cody was on commentary for this. He's, you know, just a very basic thing. Just, hey, you know, he's talking with Shivani, with Fuka, with uh, Trish Stratus. Oh, I think technically, I think it took Trish off of this. Right? Yeah, whatever. I think it took, tr I know, it must have took, uh, taken Fuka off of it. Uh, because you can only have three people on commentary, but, uh, Cody, he's just hyping up Tony Lautens, uh, you know, saying, like, hey, he's a great wrestler, I'm gonna be so excited when we finally have our U.S. title match. Cody's just putting over Lautens. After this, 95 rated segment. Uh, thank you, OneDrive. Very simple, it's just a hype package. Uh, shows Brock Lesnar, John Moxley, all their stuff. Uh, they're all talking a little bit. Paul Heyman does stuff. Pop the crowd. Uh, well, pop a rating, rather. Main event, John Moxley defeats Brock Lesnar. 79 rated match. Pretty meh, but I'm guessing... Yeah, declining physical ability, stamina... Uh, this was, if I can show it, car crash match. It's all over the place. Um, it, yeah, again, it's just all over the place. Uh, it starts off real hot, you know, they charge in. Honestly, I could see Brock hitting an F5 within the first, like, minute. But Moxley, he manages to probably rope break. Who even was the, who was the ref for this? Uh, alright, Rick Knox. Good match. Um, uh, it's just a crazy match overall. Mox, he might go back into his death match roots. I don't know how okay Brock would be with it. Um, so obviously, you know, tentatively. But, in the end, probably it's close to Brock getting a win, but Mox ends up hitting the paradigm shift. Which I think is the same as the Death Rider. And that finishes the show. 84 rating. I believe that is our best show of all time. Uh, might have... You know, I think it is. I think it is. I think we've had a few... We might have one show. Revolution might have been an 84. But I think this is our best by one point. I think we've had one 83 and a few 82s. But a very good show. Um... Very much held up by our opener and our main, but as well as segments. I, again, as you can see by the fact that I have blue ratings, I'm finally learning how to book segments. But, important show still. Uh, Kota Ibushi got captured by ninjas. That's really all you need to say. <laughs> 